Okay, hi guys. Um, I'm giving tonight's presentation. Oh, there's a really bright light in my eye <laughs> that I didn't expect. I'm giving tonight's presentation on Packet Radio, and I want to thank John for inviting me to do that way a million years ago. I think it was December 2019. It seems like a whole nother life, but, it, but thank you for the invitation. Finally, the day has come. Um, so before I start my talk, this is in the news. It may have been talked about earlier tonight. Uh, probably because today reporting begins today, but the FCC has a requirement to, to report the RF exposure in your shack um, if you fall under the rules that require you to report, which I, I'm not going to, I don't know what those are. But I got an email in the middle of the night last night from Charles Hargrove, uh, N2NOV, and here's a link to an online calculator. So if you like this talk and you request the slide deck, which I will share freely, and you go to anything in purple, you can get the reference or the link that I'll be talking about. So this is an online calculator. You just put in a couple of pieces of data and it will tell you the report that you need to give to the um, FCC. So uh, I thought it would be a useful tool and I wanted to share it with everybody. It seemed very timely. So here's the beginning of my talk. So I'm going to give a quick uh, overview of packet radio. And again, uh, my name is Regina Monaco, N2RNA. Uh, I have a little bit of history. Actually, so a couple of things. When John first asked me to give this talk, what I was thinking in my head was this is going to be so easy. When I was a brand new ham, um, 2004, the first talk I gave in, in ham radio was an introduction to packet radio. And it was, um, I had done a very simple project, or it felt simple at the time. Uh, at, I was a member of the uh, amateur radio club at NASA Ames and they wanted to set up a packet station. I'm a new member, I'm like, I'll set it up. It turned out it was the easiest installation ever. Everything worked. So I thought I was this big packet radio expert. So I give this talk, and I thought I would just show you guys the slides tonight. So when I finally uh, looked at them, the last time I was supposed to give the talk, not in December, but months before, and they were completely outdated. Packet radio had gone so far and evolved so many iterations that the talk, while it would have made sense, wouldn't have been very helpful to anyone. So I just thought that was kind of funny. So I wanted to slow show you guys this slide from that talk. So, um, okay, so let's talk a little bit, what is amateur packet radio? So my impression, by the way, is that there's a lot of members who know more about this than I do, for sure. Uh, there are members who are curious, and there are people who've been, who've been doing this for years. So I'm gonna aim this talk to people who don't know very much about packet radio. So we're gonna just be an introduction. So what is amateur packet radio? So um, it's using radio, which is an audio analog signal, um, using radio communications uh, to send digital signaling instead of audio. And to do that, to do that transformation, we use specialized hardware called a TNC, and I'll be saying more about that. That's a terminal node controller. Uh, various software and uh, digital protocols and modes. So that's the basic uh, overview of what it is. The transmission of the digitized data goes out over a channel, um, which would be over the air on a frequency, and the amount of data, uh, whether it's measured in bits or baud, which are slightly different, um, sent depends on the channel bandwidth that you're using. And that's so, sort of very basic stuff about radio. Um, the data that you send out, just like your radio signal, it's broadcast over a geographical area limited only by what your antenna can reach uh, or your connectivity. So data packets can, uh, if you're just using your antenna, go the distance your antenna goes, or they can go internationally because since it's packet radio, you can not only transmit peer-to-peer -peer or simplex, but also digipeter to digipeter, which is relaying packets. And if you have access to something called an eye gate, you can get your packets onto the internet and send them anywhere you like. So uh, data will just be sent over the internet. Assuming the internet is up and running, your packets will get out. So there's some differences with packet radio that you wouldn't expect uh, on, on uh, audio radio, on normal radio operations. For example, and I'm gonna say more about this in other slides, you can establish a private connection or a chat room, depends on your opinion of what this what this really means, right? It's not private, nothing can be encrypted in, in amateur radio, but you can set up a connection between stations 
whilst over the same frequency that other people are using, but the packets that you send will be for a, a mail or a text message, and it can be directed to get to a single person. So it will either go on a special um, portion of their screen that only they will see, or it can go into a, a setup very much like a pine in the old days of using mail, so a personal mailbox. And that means that you're having a, a bulletin board service which runs on this mysterious hardware that I mentioned, the terminal node controller. This is all very simple. If you haven't heard this before, it's a lot of alphabet soup for a while, but it's, it's really set up to be quite easy to do. Um, and as you would expect, these networks, these BBS networks can retrieve, forward, um, save, store and forward your private messages data that's sent or anything that you'd expect to be able to send over um, a network in packets uh, from the BBS, depending on the software capabilities of the BBS. So, next. So there's a little history here, and I am going to skip through some of the slides. So back in 69, and there's a lot of names here, and uh, for new members you won't remember this, but Paul gave a great talk on uh, TCP IP, and he gave some of this history at the time. It's sort of the <coughs> origin of the internet, not so much uh, packet radio, or is it? Let's take a look. So there are these guys um, from various plates, um, Baronek, Bolt, and Newman, which was a, um, a contractor to ARPA, uh, which was uh, DARPA, but back in time, and uh, Vint Cerf at uh, Stanford, and they were in um, and they, uh, the IPTO office under the famous Liquider, um, and they had designed an ARPANET, and then there was other networks and other technologies that people were inventing way back uh, to connect to this nascent uh, pre-internet, this ARPANET. There was a satellite network, and there was a, they wanted to establish, they had a special uh, section and grant money and all that allocated to design what they called a mobile dynamically configure, configurable ground-based radio packet network. And it was the PRNet. And the reason that I find this PRNet very interesting is because a lot of what they learned ushered in the internet and a lot of the techniques that they use are actually still used in packet radio. So there's a lot of the vestiges of history that we're still gonna find in the networks that we have today. So here's a quote, here's a link. This is actually not clickable. It's not purple, it's not clickable, but the whole link is there to the history of computers. Um, and so the, the combination of now they had all these different networks that didn't, didn't talk to each other at the time, um, but these guys were convinced of a need for an open architecture network model uh, where any network, right, these are networks, could communicate with any other independent of um, individual hardware or software configurations. Um, this became the start, and here's a, an actual link to another bit of history, of a very layered hierarchical project that has evolved since this time moving forward um, that has resulted in today's internet. So packet radio has a significant place in this early design, and I think that's important for, for us to know. So... Um, so this is about the overview of uh, PRNet, Aloha <coughs> Net, which was another um, radio network that was set up at the University of Hawaii that was part of all this research. And uh, ARPANET began using packet technology very early. And these are early packets, right? They're not TCP IP protocols, but it's the idea of taking a bit stream and um, putting that information on uh, some kind of transmission where it has a variety of hierarchical headers that will guide it through the network. So that was important right from the beginning of the invention of the internet. So this is just uh, a little bit of that timeline, but the important thing is when governments started allowing hams, uh, private hams, not ARPA hams, not the people doing PRNet, but private hams, they said, oh, you can send ASCII over the net. Okay, well, Canada, 18 months ahead of us, approximately. So a couple of hams, actually it was mostly this guy, Hank Magnuski, and there's his call, designed what they named, I don't know why, the VADCG uh, Digipeter. So it rolls right off the tongue, it's a great name. Um, so it was, it was a piece of hardware that would allow the analog signal coming from your computer to be transformed into a digital signal that would go out on your antenna. Um, so it was a pre, it did the same thing as a TNC, but it was kind of kludgy. 
Uh, and he designed it. It ran on two meters, and he was part of a group uh, called the Pacific Packet Radio Society. Actually, I think this is an error. He was part of a Vancouver group, and I think this was a different group. Uh, but a lot of people in these days were very interested in, in working with this new, this new modality of sending information over the radio, this packet thing. So um, the FCC finally gave Americans the right to, to muck around with this technology around March 1980. Um, so a lot of things started happening at once, right? There were IEEE meetings, these guys were meeting, they were talking, the uh, VADCG Digipeter design through an IEEE meeting got into the hands of the Tucson Amateur Packet Radio Club, which is still an organization, Tapir, um, and so all these groups sort of work together, and there's more information here. So you can imagine what happened, right? Obviously they put something together. So this is all, just keep in mind, it's only about 40 uh, years ago. But basically, um, let's see. Sorry, I'm too close to this. So Doug Locklear worked together with, the, with this, um, this is a lot of the same information, I apologize. Did this switch? Yes. So I'm sorry, he worked with this VADGC board and devised a TNC terminal node controller, which is much closer to the protocol that we know today. And it actually went through a couple of iterations. There's a TNC1 and then a TNC2, still in use. Um, and TNCs also utilize a modified version of this is a packetizing protocol that predates TCP IP, and it's AX25, A for amateur radio. So that's also nice to know. Click. Okay, uh, so after all this juicy stuff, I know that you're saying, well, how do I get into this? How do I start with this? You know, TNC, like what's going on? Can I really do this? So how to start with packet radio? It can get um, um, uh, more and more of a pieces of hardware and more and more uh, adjustments and, and connections that you need to make, but you can start very simply. So I'm gonna skip this. The first thing you wanna do is you wanna download some popular software. I'm gonna mention this again on another slide, but here are names of things, very easy to find. You put this into your browser, you're gonna get a download link. Um, so APRS is one that I started with, FL Digi is very popular, DRATS, this is Joe Taylor's suite of different kinds of modes and uh, this is a very interesting software to also try. Download several and play around with them. So if the software requires it, um, then you will install a TNC or a software TNC. So now we're, what did I say, 1980? So like. 40 years later, and uh, most of what a TNC is, is, is a soundboard instructions, and a lot of that can be recreated on your computer. So you can run a software TNC, so that's much easier and much less expensive than it was you know, in the past. So that's, that's a good option. Um, so digital modes use us, this specialized software to transmit your analog to digital, not to transmit, I'm sorry, to um, modulate and demodulate, to translate the analog uh, to digital signal for these communications. So another thing you can do when you download these things, especially, or you would need FL Digi to do this, get on uh, Pan BEMS. So this is the Pennsylvania Narrowband um, Emergency Management Service, I believe, but it's, it's a net that meets weekly and you check in using the packet software. So the Pennsylvania one is Sundays at 7.30 in the morning. There's also in New Jersey and New York um, NY NBEMS and NJ NBEMS that meet, uh, I have the schedule that I can share with people. The, um, the New Jersey NBEMS is right after this one. Uh, I, th I, I, pretty, I think it's on the same frequency. Uh, another thing you can do is we have a local um, digital practice net that meets Thursday and you can talk to Mike Mandel about this. Um, it's, it's really fun, we meet around 6, 6.30 uh, Thursday evenings for a couple of hours and an open invitation to those who are interested. And here's another something to read on, I believe this is the history of packet radio. So I've mentioned this TNC several times. What am I talking about, right? Let's say a little bit more about what it is. So I've said that it's hardware and it translates your signal communications between the radio and the computer. So that first um, VADCG board around 1980, and then as I mentioned, the TNC2 board was developed over the next several years by the group at Tapir. But the general layout is you have your computer, 
you have some cabling that allows it to talk to this, these delimit what's inside of the TNC. And then the signal goes to the radio, and then the radio talks to the, the world with antennas, the world that can hear it. So the TNC is basically a set of commands, a command interpreter with a shell uh, that either goes to a dumb terminal or to some software on your computer. <coughs> and there's something called a packet assembler and disassembler, uh, and it uses the AX25 protocol. So at some point, the packets have to be also translated into TCP IP. Um, and then a modem, which does the modulation and demodulator and modulation. So that's basically what the TNC is. Um, TNCs, as I said earlier, they use the AX25 protocol. And then there's a lot of little details here um, and the kind of information that it can send and the kind of things that it does, like frequency and flow control, uh, frame assembly and disassembly, network monitoring. So there's a lot of functions that it can do. But basically, that's all invisible to you. And this is what a TNC is. Um, so you might be asking if this coolness hasn't really made you fiery to try this. Like, why? What are the advantages to using a uh, packet over just talking to radio? That seems intuitive and simple and, uh, and just fine. So some of the advantages, aside from the cool factor, is that uh, you can run your um, you can use this at very low power. You have uh, error correction. You can have private conversations. You can store and forward messages. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry. These are all the things that... Oh, so the TNC does a lot of the work of sending things maybe at times or when you're not sitting at the keyboard automatically. It also, its job is transparent. All these things that I'm saying that it's doing, it's coding, it's unencoding, analog comes in and digital comes out and vice versa, right? It's, it, you don't have any, it's just doing it. So to you, you're typing on your keyboard, it's going out over the radio. So it's very uh, simple and transparent. Um, it, can, it can travel a long way, a longer, well, not really true because there's a lot of eye gates now, even for voice. But in, in general, it's easier to get your packets to travel the world. Um, you can then use your station as a digipeter in case you don't want to put a repeater up, right? That's a little harder, but using your TNC as a digipeter is a function of the TNC. And that allows you to build local groups uh, and relay packets. So there's a lot of differences and a lot of reasons why people would want to try packet radio and it does offer a lot of advantages. Okay, this is a little more detail of what I just said. This is a link if you want to go ahead and do this. Um, there's some details, different radios take different cable connectors and there's a great guide here that uh, was essential to me when I set up a Cantronics um, so you, you will want to look at that, but it's the same thing I just said. Here's your computer, here's your TNC, here's your radio, the little antenna. And there are, um, there's a serial connection between your computer and the TNC, and then a cable that goes between the TNC and the radio. And the way those pins are connected, it, which differs from radio to radio, is, is outlined here. So that's just a little more information if you try to do that. Um... I'm going to skip this. This is just a little bit more on the Aloha Net. It's just a little more history. So we passed that. And this is a picture of the early, this actually should have been a few slides earlier, so I apologize. But this is a picture of the, not that early, right? But in 77 is a few years in. But you can see there was a lot of um, energy behind this project. Like this was mature even in 1977 when most people, unless they were in the field, weren't even aware of this. And I find this map fascinating, especially when you compare it to today, where there's just computers and wires everywhere all over the world. Um, this was the whole extent of the connection between computers. And it, go, it does go from East Coast to West Coast. And this is a little fuzzy, but here is Moffett Field, uh, which I didn't know, but it was on the original ARPANET. And just as a tidbit, when I was working there, there was a little... Uh, like a, a, a tiny little place that had a, like a handwritten sign that said, you know, museum, computer museum. This was 15 years ago, so maybe they've spiffed it up by now. But, you know, you go in there and there were these, the original computers that were on this 
network have been saved in this in this little like unceremonious display in their tiny little NASA Ames computer museum so computer history museum so I thought that was very cool that I actually saw the original machinery that was on this internet so next um, so let's talk a little bit more about the packets so what are the transmission characteristics so there's a lot of you'll see in a few slides there's a lot of different modes and a lot of different ways to send packets. They have all these names. You might have heard of some of them. I don't know, MSK31 and PSK64. And uh, there's, there's just a bunch of different ways, uh, ODFM. And they all refer to a different way that the signal is encoded um, or, uh, onto the, into and out of uh, the signals that you need to send. So, what are these characteristics? So let me actually read this a bit myself. So we know this, right? The transmission of digitized data goes out over a channel and the amount of data sent depends on the bandwidth of the channel. So if you have a mode, and I'll, again, I will explain this a little uh, deeper in a couple of slides, that uh, sends a high number of bits or a, a rapid amount, of, sends a high rate of information, it's going to use more bandwidth. So that's that we kind of know that anyway as as hams. Um, I'm going to skip that. I said that. We said that. <laughs> and we said that. Um, so there's error correction. You can have automatic link uh, control. Um, uses lower power, and when it uses lower power, it can use lower bandwidth. So those are a lot of um, transmission characteristics. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I'm also going to skip this, but I'm going to show it really quick. So the OSI model, it, I wanted to say something about the structure of packets and where they fit in at the network layer. It's just enough to be reminded that there's this hierarchical way that data travels through the network and that packets is just a part of that. So. <clears throat> I'm also going to skip this too, but I, I just want to say that there's a bit stream and as it goes through that OSI um, hierarchy, you know, there's a lot of different words. Uh, there, it becomes a frame when it has certain headers and information added to it and then a packet and then a segment. And a, um, it, it's just kind of important because sometimes people say the word frame, sometimes they say packet. It, it's just good to know that this refers to where the, the, the original information has gotten uh, through the OSI hierarchy. This is interesting. So this is what happens when you give somebody <laughs> uh, some, with some background in biology uh, to discuss packet radio with people. As I was studying uh, packets and, and coming to appreciate and understand the, the hierarchy and the construction, I kept thinking it reminded me of something and I realized that it reminded me of how information is packaged in DNA. And I actually think that that's an interesting factoid. It's not useful, but it's interesting. So this is just from a random paper. I just grabbed this. I don't even know what gene this is. And this is the DNA part up here. But basically, when you have information, um, when you have a gene, when you have information encoded <coughs> in DNA, there's a lot of layers of things that I would say are equivalent to headers. They direct um, when the gene is transcribed when it's turned on, how much of it is turned on. There are some sequences that determine where it goes ultimately when it's translated into a protein and it can be um, enhanced or silenced under different conditions or in different types of tissues. So it's just all these headers. Here's your payload, your data, right? A little more. This is a particular gene with, a, with an interrupting region uh, and then more regulatory sequence information in the footer. So something to think about. I just thought that this was a very interesting confluence. So back to packet radio. So the next part that I want to talk about is types of radio emissions. And I don't really want to spend too much time on this. But radio emissions are um, very well defined in the AARL handbook or here, which is a very nice Wikipedia page. And it just, there's a format to how the emissions are are referred to. So this 
this is like the full format, but people usually just use this part of it. So basically this is, I believe, AM sent analog over one channel or something. Um, I actually didn't memorize these. This is just a pure carrier. So these emission modes have a lot of information in them. And when we talk about modes, we're not talking about the emission mode. We're just talking about the protocol that the, the packet um, follows. So I just wanted to mention that they're emission modes because I'm sure a lot of you know, know about this anyway. This is just a picture of modulation. Um, so I'm not going to say too much because I'm sure everyone's familiar with this. Well, here's a good one. So here's a digital um, uh, sequence. Right, this is just raw bits, right? We're not talking about headers or anything now, it's one zero. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you've got your carrier at its higher frequency, and you want to um, encode, you want to carry this information on your carrier. And um, this is a particular kind uh, some of some kind of shift keying. I actually am not, I just thought it was a good picture, but you can just see that this there's a signal here, it's a one. Um, I don't know why it's discontinuous. I would show this as a lower um, frequency, a, a lower amplitude here, depending on what they're trying to show. Um, oh, I think it's amplitude shift keying. So, and then this is one again, and this is zero, one, zero, one. So that's, that's just a picture. This is multi-frequency, so these dark spots are different frequencies, and each one of these dots carries um, more than one bit of, of information, depending on which code this is. That's just a sine wave. Um, and again, let's see. So here's your digital information, and here's the signal that is sent out over the line, and here's just a cleaned up version of it. And this is a frequency shift. So you've got your digital information, you've got your carrier, right? And you can see that the frequency is, is changing. This is what's sent out on the radio. So that's what we're talking about when, we're, when we talk about modulation. So I, I don't really want to say too much about modulation, um, but here's some links. This is a great, great reference. This is about a 50-minute lecture out of a course, and you could listen to just this lecture, or there's a series of two of these, or the whole course, you know, up to you. But um, I highly recommend uh, listening to this lecture. It fills in a lot of gaps. It's very basic. It, uh, it's an excellent lecturer. Um, then here's a presentation, there's another link, then Roden Schwarz gave a whole series on modulation. This particular one uh, is on QAM and APSK. Uh, and then here's some information on measuring signal to noise ratios, S, S over N, and then there's another way to measure it, uh, which actually Claude Shannon used back in the day when he was talking about entropy and how much information could actually be sent, what's the limit of information that could be sent without error. And, um, and he used this kind of measurement, which is the energy per bit over the noise level. So that this is also very, this is a whole paper, it's very interesting. I am not going to discuss the types of modulation. This is phase modulation. It's got these, dis, these uh, discontinuities in it. This indicates when you go from zero to one. When, you, when you're picking up a discontinuity, you've switched from zero to one. Um, this is AM, right, analog modulation, so this is a almost uh, perfectly modulated signal, or if this goes to zero, your modulation ratio is one, and that's your carrier, and when you put a signal onto it, you get this change in the um, amplitude. This is a picture of, it, of digital modulation, frequency shift keying, I think, I know this is not very clear, and amplitude shift keying. Um, gives you these, these differences that can be picked up and turned into a bitstream. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this. And this, these is a, this is sort of a map of the different kinds of modulations. Um, I'm just uh, You can look at it, but, and then I'm going to pass on. Uh, okay. Oh, this is on my computer. So... Before we continue, I want to play the sounds of some of these protocols, but I have to go over to my computer and actually play the file that I prepared. I want to point out that these signs, these sounds drive my husband crazy. I really like to listen to them, but I can see him walking around the house, like, oh, pulling his hair out, and like, what's going on? Where are the aliens landing? But there's a lot of information to be gained by listening to these sounds, and you get a feel for them, and then when you hear them on the radio, you can also begin to recognize them, and you get a sense of what's being sent. 
So give me a second and I'm going to play. It's about 80 seconds of a variety of different, uh, different modes. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say their names, but I have to be behind the camera. So enjoy this slide and then you'll hear some audio in a minute. I hope I can find it, you guys. Talk amongst yourselves. Where's the screen? Not there. It's right there. Oh! are used for no 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 I don't know it was going so good hang on four twenty two oh no there's a whole playlist there this is really boring sorry I can't see anything Yes, you can see it up here, Amtor. playlist. <laughs> okay. I hope you all heard that. It's always fun to do things for the first time. So you heard that they were all very different and they had these characteristics um, that I think are interesting to listen to. And the information is in the changes, right? When you hear these changes in the signal, that's where you're telling whatever software is interpreting these signals that is switching from zero to one and back and forth. So you're reconstructing the, the data uh, from the signal. The signal. The signal is carrying the data that you want. So why are there so many different modes, right? You do one mode and, and you don't need all this noise. Well, there are different modes that do different things. Um, modes are designed to efficiently transmit information under different conditions, right? You send them at different frequencies, you have different needs. Um, sometimes you have to get your information there with no errors. Sometimes you can drop some packets. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as the, the larger message gets through. There's a lot of different conditions and different uses for sending these packets. Um, different types of data, audio, text data, image data, video data, right? These can be lossy image or video or it may be some music, but text, for example, can't be. Actually, image has its limits to how lossy that can be too. Um, so harking back to modulation, right? There are different types there of encoding. Some of them are phase, right? Changing the phase of the carrier wave, the frequency, also like this, the frequency, amplitude, modulation, right? And then there's other kinds of modes that we're not going to discuss, like spread spectrum or orthogonal modes, orthogonal frequency um, uh, division. 
Uh, so, um, and quadrature, amplitude modulation. So there's all different ways of encoding the data and they all satisfy different needs. So here are some, there's gonna be another slide with these listed also, but here are some modes. You just saw a lot of these, Domino. Uh, you saw JT65, uh, which is one of the modes invented by Joe Taylor, Thor22. Uh, this is, these are older, right? PSK31 is um, phase shift keying. And that's a baud rate that is, so you would also have, for example, PSK 64 or, uh, or higher numbers. And that will tell you not only how much information it can send per unit time, but it, as the number goes up, you're using more bandwidth. So you, there's always um, a trade-off. Olivia is a multi-frequency mode, as is uh, Dom, no, that's Contestia. Uh, I think Domino is also, but don't hold me on that. So these are all these different modes. Um, so the different modes trade off the data rate, the error correction. Some of these have forward error correction and some don't. So, so how it handles noise uh, and the bandwidth. So you would choose the best um, sound, the best mode for your purpose. Uh, next one. So here's a list of some common digital modes. I'm getting short on time, so I'm just gonna go through this pretty quickly. And here are some notes I made on them. So one of the older modes uh, is, well, the oldest mode is, is RIDI, right? It uses high power. It doesn't tolerate noise very well. So if there's a noise uh, that, that goes into the transmission, you might lose, um, you might lose that, a piece of the transmission. So the poor signal to noise. People use it in contesting. It uses the Bordeaux um, encoding set. And it's a form of a frequency shift keying. And the shift uh, is usually uh, 170 hertz bandwidth, so its bandwidth is that small. Um, PSK31 is something else I mentioned, and it, and it has uh, like a low symbol rate, so it's okay for keyboarding if you want to talk somebody keyboard to keyboard. And if the mode has name has an F in it like that, and then it has forward error correction, um, MT63 is robust under, infer under interference, not as fast as other modes. This one is, is interesting to listen to. It's a, it sounds a little bit like Olivia. Uh, so it's a multi-frequency shift keying, and um, it uses an, there should be another quote here, it uses an alphabet of sequential tones. Each tone carries more than one bit of information. It's the way the encoding was designed. Um, and it's very good for HF. It handles selective fading and multipath uh, issues and, and inter interference between symbols. So it's, it's pretty robust. Um, FT8, right, also Joe Taylor, very fast. Signal to noise ratio down to minus 24 decibels. I believe that means that you can get a signal that's 400 times smaller than the noise signal. So it's really tiny signal in all this noise. How it works, I don't know. It's amazing. Um, so it's very low power. It's got this great signal to noise ratio. It requires a very strict time synchronization, not really good for keyboarding um, it, or um, emergency communications. And this is the name of a software uh, that is gonna come up in a list. And this software will allow you to play with this mode. I mean, it's used in other places, but this software is from Joe Taylor. There's another one. Whisper, so it's used on, and it's restricted in frequencies, right, it has reserve frequency, but it, its signal to noise ratio is minus 29 decibels, and because the relationship of decibels is not linear, it seems like that's pretty close. This is 800 times lower than the noise. If the signal is 800 times lower than the noise, you can still uh, get a signal out of Whisper. That seems like magic to me. So if you're picking a mode or you're trying to understand a mode that you're using, um, you could look at lists like this. You can start with this one and get some idea of which digital mode might be good for the purposes that you want to play with. Oh, that's playing automatically. So it sounds familiar, right? What? What's going on? Look at the picture and I'll... Okay, not a radio, had to include it because 
this very cool graphic shows the information that was in all those sounds. Now, granted, this is an old modem protocol for anyone in the room who possibly has never heard that before. It went out over the copper wires of the telephone company, um, but it did a lot of things, right? Here was, you'd start with the dial tone and the phone number, so maybe that's a little unfair, but this is what it looks like. And uh, you, if you see the slide, you can see there's a lot of notations here, but basically the two machines then send a lot of information to each other. What protocols are you running? Um, what, are, what are you capable of, of doing? And these lists, this signal is translated into this data, which I can't read now. And they, the two different modems, the answering modem and the sending modem, negotiate so that they're talking the same language. So there's some dynamic uh, configurability there. And then after they determine their initial connection, there's a whole secondary negotiation where they set up a band rate and they actually send test signals, which I believe is here, where they're testing the phone line, right? Because it was a real connection, so the phone line would have different qualities, be different lengths of time, have different delays. So it would have to negotiate and, and set um, its understanding of the signals that were coming in. And then once it did that, it does this final, the thing you hear at the end, like the hissing, that's a final negotiation of, um, of what the parameters are of the communication. And then the speaker goes mute and you start your connection. So not radio, but interesting use of, of similar signaling using sound, right? It, it's really sort of, um, I don't want to confuse anyone. It, it doesn't really go in the flow of this talk, except that I like it. This is a cool graphic and I wanted to share it. So. Okay, back to packet radio. So a subset of packet radio software now. So these are things that you can look up, download, and play with. So this is a software that will send RIDI, uh, Morse code, APRS, um, very well used by a lot of people. Uh, that is a useless statement. So APRS, I'm going to say more about that in a few minutes, but APRS is, uh, it starts out as a location ser service where you connect to the APRS network and you put in your information. You're, you have to be a ham um, and it reports where you are. And if it's running on your phone and you have GPS enabled, it kind of tracks you and tells other people where you are. So it's, it's a little different, although it will send messages and you can set up groups and stuff. And it's very interesting, but it's also very easy to set up. You don't even need a radio. You just need your license. You can run this over the internet. Um, DRATS is uh, something that uh, Mike uh, uses on the Thursday evening nets where we use it to keyboard and send communications to each other. Uh, Winlink is a global uh, emailing that I will say more about in a couple slides. Outpost is sort of is like a Winlink client. Um, I don't need to read these, right? You can read them. JSA call easy pal does his videos. FL Digi is important, especially if you want to do the pan BEMS, which I had mentioned earlier. And then again, I'm referring to Joe Taylor's software, really something to download and play with. So I recommend, I recommend most of these. I, I would start with DRATS, WinLink, um, FL Digi, and this WSJTX. My recommendation, you can try whatever you want. <laughs> okay. This is very similar to an earlier slide. So this, however, is from my original talk. Remember way at the beginning, I was like, I gave this talk in 2004. So this slide survived. <laughs> it was a good picture and I stuck it in. So here, that's dating it, right? Look at this computer, uh, which is, by the way, uh, very similar to the computer that I actually set up the TNC on way back in 2004. Hard to believe, but it's the truth. So here's your computer, here's your TNC. Uh, and here's the, your radio, and then it sends a signal out to the antenna. So this is a simple cartoon of your packet station. Um, so here's your cartoon again, right? This is you. Right? You're talking to your antenna through this TNC. And I'm just reviewing, oh, this is an original slide. That's why it's here. So I got like three slides out of that talk. What can you connect to? You can connect to someone else's VBS that's up and running. Maybe you have a mailbox there. Maybe you want to say hi, uh, whatever. You can connect to that station and take advantage of whatever services they might have. Um, you can set up your own personal BBS. You can be this person and mailbox at, at home. And you can do a keyboard to keyboard with a friend who has 
a similar system, right? They're set up just like this, and you just run this backwards, and now you're keyboarding with them. Okay, ah, this is also from the original slide deck. Um, so your originating station, this is the, dealing with the digipeter idea. So you can have a friend who, uh, or a, a digipeter, someone who's running their TNC as a digipeter, that you can reach, and then they can hop over to someone else, right? You have to have the path set up so that you're going in the right direction. And you can follow this path and get to a destination that might be very far away. You'll notice you haven't been on the network. I mean, I'm sorry, you haven't been on the internet. You've made your own path uh, and sent signals to whoever you want. For example, I have a friend in Arizona who's a ham. Is, I, can't, I haven't done it yet, but I'm looking for stations along the way that I can, I can see if we can put together some way without using the internet and using digipeters to get a message to him. So I haven't done it yet, but that's, that's the kind of thing that you would do with something like this. Um, this is talking again about the hardware. We're going back in time here. I'm going to skip it. So this also I've said, right, I think I've made my plug for, for these softwares uh, several times, and I, they've chosen for their usefulness, their ease of use, and their popularity. So um, if you haven't tried before, give them a try. So I'm going to talk um, about these, these softwares. I'm going to say a little bit first about WinLink. So the first thing it's going to say on the next slide, how do you get started with this? You download it, right? Just start out with downloading it, and then I'm providing a link that you can set up a password and register with WinLink and then use the software that you've downloaded. It's very simple. But here's the structure of WinLink, right? You've got these common message servers that used to be five physical machines run by amateurs in five physical locations on the planet. There were two in the U.S., where Canada had one, some country in Europe, I don't remember which one, and Australia, right? Uh, so, however, in 2017, the WinLink people, not me, <laughs> I had nothing to do with this, decided that instead of running these, these nasty physical servers that you can actually see and manage, and you know they're there, dedicated to this task, they were going to run it on Amazon Oz. So all these machines are gone. I don't know what various people did with them. Um, and this is now running in the cloud through Amazon. A lot of people think this is okay. I don't think it's great, but that's how it is. So these common message, server, common message servers all talk to the internet. Then there's a layer of digipeters. These are users. Uh, remote message servers um, can also talk to the internet, or they can just talk to each other. And then this is users, right? And there's a telnet, there's WinLink telnet also that you can sort of directly connect to and get right into the internet. Uh, so it's, you can see it's, it's its own network, and it has a lot of ways of getting information from user to user. Originally set up for use by uh, people at the sea, marine um, users, and, uh, and it has grown into being something that a lot, of, a lot of packet radio people use. Very common. Actually, there are government agencies that use it. You know, it's a very robust and commonly used software, so I recommend playing with it. I do not recommend maybe liking it or trusting it, but it is something good to have in your armamentatorium of tools to use in packet radio. Low battery warning. Oh, okay. I'm going to run through this fast because the battery's going. Um, so I'm actually going to skip this. Keep going. This is my uh, grievance of uh, the um, these machines being run at Amazon. I already mentioned it. If you want to read the, the slide deck, you're welcome to do that. And this is what I said I would say, right, how to get started. Here's the link to download it. You can also set up um, your email would be your call sign at winlink.org. That's mine. Um, here's a link. Here's also a link to a, a software TNC. And then uh, configure the cables and software, which I mentioned earlier. And there's a, another link to that fantastic resource for setting up your cable between your rig and your TNC. A tricky escapade, indeed. Um, OK. Now, APRS is the second software that I'm going to mention, and then I'm going to end this talk because it's running very long. Uh, so it's described, these are not my words, it's a tactical communication system of tremendous capability. So that's from somebody at APRS. 
Um, but I think actually it's true. And it's designed to be lightweight and simple to use. Click here and download it. Um, Bob Bruninga is the, one of the authors of it. It's compatible with these software modems, right? And uh, as I said way earlier in the talk, the data is sent using the X25 frames and digipeters and the whole, the whole same stuff. It, to use it, you need a passcode. So um, get the passcode by linking here and download the software by linking there. And these are its capabilities. So this is to give you a taste of why you might want to use it. Um, actually, that's the next slide. This is some quote from the people who, who are running APRS. So actually, um, I'm sorry, I left that out. I'm trying to rush. So it can send uh, emergency um, information, it can send weather information, it can send uh, local information to local groups, it can send, did I already say this, um, emergency notices. Uh, actually, let me go back a slide, if you can. F okay, flow of information, so you can use it during special events, emergencies. Um, an EOC can use it. Uh, transient stress situations, that's not my words, that's, this is from the APRS website. And, the, oh, this is important, I didn't want to lose this, leave this out. So all stations within zero or one digipeter hops are guaranteed by their standards, right? I think it's pretty robust that they will receive the info in 10 minutes. So all stations, that could be a wide, that could be a group as big as this club, we could all be um, in one group and we would all get the information within 10 minutes. That is, that is a very useful tool. So next. So that's part of the capabilities. This is from the APRS site and uh, it's just their top level page and there's a link to this but it show, it's got different frequencies in different parts of the world. It does, unlike other um, software, it runs on one frequency. You tune into this frequency in the US and you are on the APRS uh, network. Actually this is worth a whole talk. There's a lot more functionality of APRS than I even realized before I started this talk. It's a very useful tool. So there are no more slides. Uh, part of the talk was that I was going to show some of the software and I, uh, I don't have internet where I'm now doing this. So I'm unable to do that. But uh, any questions, you know, uh, when, when we meet again in person, which I hope is real soon, please ask me, email me. You can use my WinLink email, use my regular email. I hope this was useful and interesting, and I want to thank you guys for listening, and I will see you at the next meeting. Take care.